Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, former Celtic player, Alan Thompson. All right, James. How are you, brother? Good, thank you. Good. Good to I, see I'd, you again. Uh, had a night up in Greenock last night at the Celtic Supporters Club, so I thought I'd pop in and see you. How was that? Ah, it was good. It was good. It was a good turnout. So um, you get a bit of a laugh and a bit banter, you know, so promoting the book as well. So no, it was all good. Good, mate. How's the book going? Yeah, good. Good. Had some really good feedback. Um, obviously, it's not been out that long, really, about five or six weeks. So uh, no, positive. Yeah. Great career. A lot of trophies. You start off was at Newcastle. Yeah, I started at Newcastle as a kid. Um, obviously, that was that was my dream as a kid to play for Newcastle, you know, and uh, meet your heroes, you know, Kevin Keegan, Peter Beardsley, Gaza. So some uh, some stories about Gaza in there. So I, I, that was me. That was that was that was the start of my career. Yeah. Some some uh, names that looks that's some legends back from. Then it was what Aston Villa big move, then Celtic, and then kind of. Like great career at Celtic, nine trophies you won. But before we get into all that, brother, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Ah, yeah, I was uh, I was from, as you call it, in Glasgow, a, a scheme, but in in uh, Newcastle, it's a it's a council estate, like so. You know, that was my life out, out out in the streets, kicking the ball around. You know, rough and ready and happy childhood. You know. Um, not not the wealthiest family in the world by any means, but you know, your mum and dad go out to work and uh, always had a football at my feet. Love football. Aye, that was that was that was my first love, and uh, that's all I know. It's all I've ever known. So it's um, I know we'll get onto it a bit later, and that's that's all I've known, and I've not done it for a few years now. So it's, you know you know what it's like when you're not working, you can get a bit down in the dumps and stuff. So yeah, I'd like to get back involved in some capacity. Was your old boy a Newcastle fan? No, he was a Leeds fan, believe it or not. Aye, so. Um, Great towards the end of my career, I got the chance to go to Leeds and captain of Leeds United, you know. So that was that was proud for me, old man, with him being a Leeds fan. Was that because of your dad? What going to Leeds? Yeah. No, not really. It was just it was when I left Celtic. It was uh, Dennis Wise was the manager of Leeds at the time, Wisey, and uh, got the opportunity to go there. And I thought it was a great club to go to towards the end of your career, you know. What were you like at school? Shite. Were you? Aye, I was great at pottery. Uh, so no, I didn't get any qualifications apart from the pottery one. So. Uh, no, I wasn't. Uh, wasn't. It was. It was all sport and pottery, basically. No, I didn't. Didn't concentrate at all. Fucking pottery. Oh, it was brilliant. Had it, pal. Brilliant, <laughs> man. Well, it's some fucking Patrick Swayze shit with it. I, I, I wish. I the wish. Pot and the, the, the mud. All the teachers knew when I was missing lessons where I would be. I'd be in the fucking art class doing pottery. Yeah. And was that right with the little machines and the clay and oh, I, the I, water? I was, I, I was shit hot to be fair. Do you I, still have anything that you made? Um, I think my mum's still got a few bits in the house, but uh, no, I've not gotten out, no. What was your first football team? Um, probably my first Battle Hill first school. And then I got on, got involved at uh, Walls End Boys Club, which is great tradition. Um, you've probably heard of like to Steve Bruce, Peter Beardsley, Alan Shearer, uh, Michael Carrick. So a, a massive hotbed for uh, for young talent in the North East. Yeah. What was it? When did you start finding a passion for football? Did you realise you had a bit of a talent? I think it was probably about eight or nine. Ah, uh, once you start playing for a team and you know you start kicking about and you start getting the scouts knocking on your door and talking to your parents and that. So um, I was got a lot of interest when I was a kid. Man United, Nottingham Forest, Spurs, Chelsea, but obviously it was Newcastle where I wanted to go. You know, was you always always left footer? Oh, I always left footed. 
like Jamie said to us last night, Jamie Boyle, who's done me book, he said uh, that right foot was just for standing on, wasn't it? But I said, hey, I don't know. I Stefan Kloss, the Rangers goalie. I scored a couple of my right foot past him. But I predominantly left footed, yeah. yeah. When did you go to Newcastle? What age? I think I signed when I was about 13. 13 on uh, on schoolboy forms. And then uh, obviously when I left school, then that was when I went in full time. What was that like for you? Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. Um, it's your dream, innit? You know, I don't know who your team was as a kid. Who was your team? Yeah, Celtic. So if, if you got the opportunity to play for Celtic, it would be your dream, wouldn't it? And it was, that was my dream. My first dream was to play for Newcastle and I achieved that. I was lucky because I had a bad car crash when I was 16. So I, I broke my neck. So it was touch and go whether I was going to walk again, never mind play football again. So I was out for two years, 16 to 18. So it was a big time of your life, you know, 16, 18, learning your trade, trying to get on get on the football ladder if you want. And uh, I had the car crash, which put us right on the back foot. So I was a lucky boy to get back fit from that. Yeah, that's crucial years, 16 and 18. That's when you're kind of developing, I think, between 14 and 18. That's when you kind of see the boys who are going to make it. The, the talent gets you so far, but at a certain age, it's then this consistency of the people who work harder than you that kind of keep rising. Aye. And, and, and for me as well, my mates, lads, Steve Watson, Lee Clark, Robbie Elliott, they were all breaking into the team while I was out injured. So I'm sitting in the stands watching my best mates who I've grew up with, playing with, getting into the first team. So it was frustrating, you know, but it just gives us all the more incentive to get back fit and, and get on the pitch with them lads, you know. What happened with the car crash? Uh, the lad that was driving, lad called Mickey English, fell asleep at the wheel. So we were on the A1, we'd been down Elland Road, actually, Leeds to watch a reserve team game. And I'd not long left school, I was only 16. And he dozed off at the wheel. And in the, the old style Mini, which isn't a particularly big car, it was five were in there. And that's what the wreck and saved us. That we were that close together in the car when it rolled. We kind of took the impact off each other. So not a nice, and there was no there was no lights on that part of the motorway. So when the car ended up on its roof, 11 o'clock at night, pitch black, it's on its roof. You think, what's happened here? And uh, next thing you know, you're in an ambulance and they're cutting your clothes off and all that. I was like, ah, don't cut my shell suit off. You can't cut that off. It's brand new. First time I've had it on. They were like, fuck that. I was blood all over the place and pff, cut us off and straight. And I was in hospital for three or four weeks at first, yeah. And that, what was it like getting told that you might not ever play football again? I don't think I knew how serious it was, James. It was a Wednesday night. And on the Saturday, I was going away with the England under 17s. We had a game in Iceland. And I said to the nurses, first night in hospital, I said, well, am I going to be fit for Saturday? <laughs> and they were like, no, we'll, we need to speak to your parents and stuff like that, son. So real tough time, not just for me mentally and physically, obviously, but uh, probably tough for my mum and dad, knowing that a 16-year-old boy being in a serious car crash, you know. Did everybody survive? I, um, there was myself who, who I broke my neck and then there was another lad called Phil Mason, who I mentioned in the book. He, uh, he got thrown out the window when the car was rolling. So when, we stopped, when the car stopped on its roof, we're like, everyone all right, everyone all right. I didn't know I was seriously injured at first. It must have been the adrenaline and the shock or what have you. But there was only four of us in the car. So we're like, where's Phil? Where's Phil? And it wasn't until the police come and the services and got the lights on and all that, they found him under the centre reservation. Luckily, he wasn't dead, but he'd fractured his spleen and broke his pelvis. He was in hospital bed next to us in the ward. So we were lucky, aye. That's fucking heavy, I don't know. Un unbelievable, mate, honestly. And... Uh, just the experience in hospital, there was, it was like three beds on this side, three beds on that side. One guy comes in just an hour after me and he was refusing to give a breath test. He smashed all his hands in a car crash and he was refusing the police. So there was aggro going on and I'm like, what's going on here? A couple of days later, the bloke opposite over there woke up in the morning, he'd lost his sight. And I'm like, is this a mental home or is this a hospital? <laughs> it was like, it was mental, you know, so it was, but uh, no, it was there uh, that the staff were great, the nurses and there uh, obviously got some, uh, got a lot of good visitors and stuff like that to perk you up, you know. But no, it was a difficult time thinking, am I going to play football? What am I going to do? I've only got a pottery qualification, you know. What am I going to do if I can't get back fit or if I end up in a wheelchair? So you can imagine all the thoughts going through your head as a 16-year-old kid. Did Newcastle stick by you? Oh, Newcastle were brilliant. Um, even when they were unsure if I was going to get fit or not, on my 17th birthday, they gave us a pro contract. So they were kind of like, you know, just to try and perk us up and keep us um, keep us positive if you want. But the physio, Derek Wright, who's still at Newcastle now, um, he's done a little bit in the, in the front of the book about it, how severe the injury was. And uh, no, Newcastle were brilliant. Aye. How's uh, coming back from that though, like training-wise, what was the steps? Bike? <sighs> aye. Uh, hand, hand bike. Then um, I had this big collar on, 
round me, all the way up my torso, up my face, up the back of my head. So it affected me. My skin was a mess all over my chest, and if, oh, it was it was horrible. So first and foremost, it was getting rid of that collar. I, I'd done it in the September, and then and I was in for four weeks hospital. Got out with this brace thing on horrible the lads used to call us robocop and uh, <laughs> yeah, cuz that was on at the time robocop I and then it wasn't healing the, the two fractures in my neck weren't healing so I had to go back in in the january and get pins and plates put in so you can imagine that you know just if you I've already done a month in hospital then going back in after christmas in the january to get the surgery get the pins in took some bone from my hip and grafted it in my neck. It was it was pretty serious stuff. So it was a slow process um, after the bike, then jogging and then gradually getting the ball out. And then obviously the last step, starting to head a balloon and then starting to just try and get moving and then head, heading the ball. And then that was, it was nigh on two years until I got back and played my first match. But listen, I got back, so. What was it like playing your first match back? Were you worried? Oh, I, I was petrified. Um, tackles, going up for aerial challenges. It was it was a mental, um, it was probably a mental block I had. And um, later on in my career, I had, a, uh, I had a big problem of vomiting before games. So certain managers didn't like it. Kevin Keegan being one, Bruce Rioch being another one at Bolton. So Bruce Rioch sent us to see a psychologist about it, see if it would stop the vomiting because, you know, not good vomiting before a game, you're losing fluids and you don't lose fluids, you're dehydrated, you're going to get injured or you're not going to perform. So the psychologist put it down to the possible fear of getting a serious injury again after having my neck. So, um, but it didn't cure the vomit and I carried on all the way through my career. Last stopped playing at 34, it was just something I'd done. What about getting in a car again? Um, as a passenger, not great. I'm all right when I'm driving, but I'm not a great passenger, like, you know, because I'm not in control. So I, that was another hurdle I had to get over. So then you ended up Newcastle, and where did you go after that? Bolton. Mm -hmm. Who was that Bolton? There, big stubs in that. Big Stubbsy, uh, Jason McAteer, uh, John McGinley, Owen Coyle, uh, Andy Walker, Mixu Patalainen, Dave Lee, Keith Brannigan, goalkeeper. So it was that was a good time at Bolton, aye. Mm -hmm. aye. And then you got your four and a half million pound move to Villa. Went to Villa. That's aye. a big fucking move. How old were you? I was twenty three. 23 so it was it was a big That's move a at the time then, it, was, it? it was it was a big fee so that was a dressing room full of characters at villa you had the you had the mersons uh collymores uh benito carboni david Ginola, gareth southgate hugo Ekiog, god bless him not bosnich david james so it was going from a, a good dressing room at bolton but with no superstars if you want and then going to villa where there was some proper big hitters you know chaos i had i had yeah. mercer on a couple of weeks ago he's a character oh he's a character yeah. Aye. 150 grand bet he's put on lost over seven million like <sighs> phenomenal it's isn't just it? uh what was mercer like at villa because that was at the end of his career eh? that was towards the end i he, we signed him from middlesbrough because went i don't know you must have told you when he was at middlesbrough he lived with gaza didn't he yeah him gaza and andy townsend lived together so that would have been interesting, wouldn't it? Merce and Gaza in the same house. So, uh, <laughs> no, he was he was good. He was a talented footballer, Merce, no doubt about that. But everyone he, public about his problems and stuff. So, he was a hell of a player. Yeah. What about Ginola, man? Because he was a baller. Oh, at New was it Ginola, Newcastle, Tottenham. Newcastle, Tottenham. I think he had a spell at Everton as well, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Um, Who was it? Villa. Brilliant, brilliant, David. He was my hero because he was at Newcastle. Mm -hmm. When I left and went to Bolton, he then signed for Newcastle. So I used to watch him and think, what a player he is. So then to be in the same dressing room as him, I was delighted when he uh, he took his kit off on the first day, man, what a body he had. And he's, he's got his slips on. I thought, if he takes them slips off and he's got a massive, <laughs> it's just not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a God. And he took them off and it was a little one. So I'm jumping around <laughs> the dressing room, giving it cool, <laughs> son. <laughs> hey, that's why. Were you fighting for your positions out in the left? Aye, aye, we were, aye, but um, I wasn't there. Like, I think I was only six months there with David and then I was off to Celtic after that. So, But uh, no, I was some boy, the women loved him. Why such a short career for her? Did you get injured? Was it Achilles or something? Yeah, uh, I'd done my ankle ligaments. I mean, it started off well. The first six months, we were top of the league at Christmas um, and it was going all right. Then I'd done my ankle ligaments in New on New Year's Day and I just didn't get back to where I was before that. And... Um, so I kind of sat around in the doldrums for 18 months until Martin and Neil come knocked in, I. What was that call when you Celtic? Did you know much about Scottish football? Aye, you with aye, big Stubbs in that aye, Stubbsy, Stubbsy was obviously there. Tommy Johnson was at Celtic as well at the time. He was a pal. 
Um, and then lads in the Bolton dressing room like McGinley and Coyley and that, they were big Celtic fans, so I knew all about it. I, but I don't think it's till you get there, till you you know it's a big club, you know it's got a big fan base. But it's when you're going fucking around the world, you know, you're going to America pre-season or winter break, you're going to uh, Australia, you're going to the Far East, and there's Celtic fans all over the place. So you know it's a big club, but I think only when you play for them do you realise how big it actually is. Because you hit the ground running. Did you, what, did you won a treble the first year, is that correct? Aye, aye. I think, did Celtic not lose the season before the Rangers yeah. by about 18 points? Mm -hmm. And then Martin O'Neill come in and said, I'll try and close the gap. He didn't close the gap. He went and won the treble, so it was some start. How good a manager was he for you at the start? Brilliant, mate. He was uh, he was old school. You know, you can tell he played for Cluffy and stuff like that at Forest. He wasn't um, he wasn't a coach. He didn't go on the training ground and tell us what he wanted us to do. Or you go there, you go here. He was just good at seeing the right thing at the right times and make you feel ten foot tall. You know, at that era, it's probably the best Celtic team I've ever seen. I um, it was Larson, Sutton, Big Bobo, yourself, Lubo. Yeah. Like, it, absolute ballers and you, yeah. you don't realise how good they are until you actually watch the old videos and you think wow what a team ah, it was even a... the Rangers team what a fucking team that was a, that team was a they good had Rangers team yeah. Avaladzi Michael Moles, yeah. Barry Ferguson mm -hmm. um, Big Bob Malcolm but he was pissed off you're watching big, Bob. big Bob <laughs> the big hot carrier <laughs> <laughs> he's a big guy that's Avaladzi Michael Moles Barry Ferguson Barry Ferguson yeah. Yeah. Big Bob Malcolm but he was pissed off you're watching Albert Albert was there at the time Um the manager of Rangers now was there at the time. Um, I was a good Rangers team, so we, we, we did. We wiped the floor with them. You think in your first season, this is a piece of piss? Not really. I, to be fair, James, I thought my Celtic career was over before it started. I got sent off in my first all firm game at Ibrox and we got beat 5 1. So I remember going back to my ex missus and saying, We were in a rented house at the time. I said, I don't think we should buy a house, love. <laughs> why? I said, Well, after what's just happened in the dressing room after the game, I thought Martin was going to rip me head off. So um, I was like, that my Celtic career could be over. You know, I've just got a red card and uh, got beat 5-1. But uh, luckily the next old firm game at Celtic Park of 1-0 and I scored. So I kind of redeemed myself after the, the first red. What was that like for you? The, the, the derbies, they're the biggest derbies in the world for, because it's the pure hatred. Like, Aye. They are, you've got your Boko Juniors and stuff and that, but the Celtic Rangers is pure hatred. Like, there's no fucking word. Like, you can't deny it. It's a cut above the rest, like you mentioned, Boko and... Milan and Inter Milan and you know it's uh, Liverpool, Man, Man United. Yeah. The class is a big derby. Tottenham, Arsenal. But this is just you know living in Glasgow. But for people who don't li live in Glasgow and know about the old firm, it's just it's it's like no other. It's just the hatred that comes with it. It's like a week before the game and then a week after the game yeah, as well type of thing. Up. So um, it's just. And I always say to people, if you get a chance to go to an old firm game, whether you're a Celtic fan or you're a Rangers fan or you're not an old firm fan, just go to sample the atmosphere, how different it is to anything else. What was that like for you walking out at Ibrox for the first time? Oh, it's brutal. It's brutal, mate. It's mental when that team bus pulls, pulls up outside Ibrox and there's like a couple of thousand Rangers fans there to boo you getting off the bus. It's great when you get back on the bus and you've won and they're not there. Do you know what I mean? So... It's a brutal place. It's a, it's a great place to play. Listen, the atmosphere and what have you. It's, it's a wonderful stadium, but uh, it's intense going there, aye. And what was what was going through your mind when you were in the dressing room getting sent off and you hear the fans cheering every fucking 10 minutes? I, I, well, it was 2-1 when I went off. Um, Who did you, why did you get sent off? It was two yellow cards. Um, the second one was a mis mistimed tackle on Barry Ferguson, I think, but... Uh, you go in and you like you say you hear the whoa three one then you hear the next one whoa four one then five one and you think I've let the lads down yeah I've let the gaffer down I've let the lads down I've let the fans down I've let myself down and uh, you apologise after the game but you know that that doesn't that, that doesn't brush up does it and you get sent off and you get humped five one so as you can imagine the gaffer wanted to rip my head off how good was Barry Ferguson Barry was a good player. Um, like you say, he played in a good team, didn't he? And he, he he went to Rangers as a kid and played for all those years. So you don't play for a club the size of Rangers in good teams if if, you, if you're an average player. So tough opponent. Used to have a few run-ins with him. So I. Mm -hmm. You had a great career against Rangers, man. Was it eight goals you scored? Seven goals, I in twenty-six games, which is not bad for a wing back, really. Mm -hmm. My job was more to supply the, the the big hitters up front, Henrik and Chris and John. But uh, to, to score seven is quite uh, proud of it. That's one of the, the most from us out of playing. Your top five or top ten like, up Aye. there has scored the most against Rangers. That Aye. must make you feel okay. Aye, that makes you feel okay. But then 
as Jamie Boyle, the author of my book, always brings up, you hold a record for the three red cards as well. So that's something I'm not proud of, but obviously the seven goals, I can't take that away from us. All at Ibrox as well? All at Ibrox. Is that mate, nerves man. though? Um, it could, I bit of nerves. I mean, the first one that I spoke about in the 5-1 game, that might have been two yellow cards, but then I get a straight red for an alleged headbutt on Peter Love and Kranz, which was never a headbutt. But... Um, it was funny, I was. I said last night, we were down at John Horton's golf day at Turnbury a few years ago and there was a referee there speaking after the dinner and Martin O'Neill said to him, John, John, what's your opinion on the red card Tomo got at Ibrox? And uh, on Peter Lovencrantz in this, John Robottom said there, well, there was a bit of intent there, so if there's intent, it's a straight red card and Martin O'Neill went to him, John, you're talking bollocks. It was never a red card. And I put my glass of red wine, red wine down, I went, gaffer, did you say that was never a red card? He went, Tomo, never a red card. Absolutely not. And I went, you find me two weeks' wages for that. <laughs> he went, I'll get you a glass of red, Tomo. I was like, I got done two weeks' wages mm. for that one. So, And the next season again, you won the league? Aye, aye. It was uh, it's a good habit to get into, you know. But when like you mentioned some of the lads there, Henrik, John Orton, Chris Sutton, Bobo Bolly, Johan Mialbi, Josval Harren. Henrik, um, Neil Lennon, Paul Lambert, Stillian Petroff, they're all winners, do you know what I mean? Mm. Paul Lambert's won the Champions League playing for Dortmund, so we just had a mentality in the dressing room that, you know, we just wanted to crack on and win trophies. Didier Ragat as well, man. Didier, Didier signed the same day as me, man, for 30 grand. I mean, what an absolute... 30 grand? What yeah. would you get for 30 grand now? I think he'd be worth about 20, 30 million now, especially at that era when against when he's got the European one. Like his performances was unbelievable. He couldn't fucking cross the ball, man, for shit. Right no, enough, he couldn't but... cross the road, yeah. but uh, he was he was <laughs> unbelievable. He was, but he, he got injuries, like, you know, he'd get hamstring injuries because he was that powerful and that yeah. quick. But he could be out for four weeks and Martin would say to him, Didier, I need you fit for this old firm game coming up. I need you fit for this European game coming up. And he wouldn't train for four weeks and then he trained for two days before the game and come back in. He was like a machine. Just phenomenal, just an unbelievable athlete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cup run, the UEFA cup run, like unbelievable. That like, I don't know if I'll ever see that again. I ho hopefully I will. But to go through that experience, man, like getting out through the who was the first game? Was it Sadova, I think. And then after that was uh, was it Stuttgart? Um, or Blackburn. It might have been Blackburn, then Stuttgart. Um, How was the Blackburn game? Because you were a massive underdog Scottish team. We don't get any credit up here. Like, we're just no, shite. Huge underdogs, obviously. They were a Premier League team at the time. Had some, you know, that Dwight York up front and Andy Cole up front, you know, two top world class strikers. Mm -hmm. And um, and Graham Souness being the manager, he uh, he kind of wrote us off after the first leg, didn't he? He said in the papers, men against boys. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, how can you write a team off when you got Henrik Larson up front and people like that in the team? So I went down there and beat, beat Blackburn and then not long after that, we went Anfield and, and beat them. So it was an unbelievable run. The teams would beat Stuttgart, what a decent team. Felix Maggot was a manager at the time. Uh, Leb was playing midfield for them. Balakov was playing for them. And it was it's even now nearly 20 years on. It's 20 years next year. Can you believe that? 20 oh, years since Seville and there. Uh, so the boys are on about getting back together and having a bit of a reunion, which should be fun next year to catch up with everyone. But and then going to Anfield, winning two 0 was you know even then we got wrote off. So um, that was special times, and even now twenty years down the line, people want to talk about it. Yeah, one each, was it one each at Parkhead? Aye, aye, and then uh, um, you got the goal at Anfield, didn't you? I scored, the the first, I, I scored just before half time, and then. Super hard smashed one in at the Anfield Road end in the second half. So it was it was an unbelievable night. You know, both sets of fans singing, you never walk alone. The atmosphere was just unbelievable. So, but we deserved to win. We played well. You know, it was a good Liverpool team. Gerard, Carragher, Schmitzer, Dudek in goal. So it was a proper Liverpool team. So Deep Mohaman in midfield. So to go there and win 2 0 was some achievement. I think that shows the quality of the Celtic team. Like, and getting a bit of credit that it deserved. Like, this, the team was full of winners. Like, Full of ballers, man, like tough, like the Hartson and Sutton and, and Larson. And the, like Larson was a world class player. A lot of people never seen it until the later years. The Celtic fans seen it, mm -hmm. but obviously he's playing in Scotland, so he doesn't. But then it, it proves that what he done at Barcelona and Man United for his short spell, that like how good he could adapt to any team. Oh, that's that was it was phenomenal. I mean, you, you, you people would say, Yeah, he couldn't do it at the top level. Top level, he was doing it for Sweden for years before Celtic, and uh. I think some people were shocked when he went to Man United and Barcelona and done what he'd done, but no surprise to us because he was he was world class without a doubt. Did you see that at training? Unbelievable. Some of the stuff. Remember the goal he scored against Rangers where he like knocked that. it around and he yeah. flips it over the top. 
he would do things like that and he'd make goalkeepers look stupid and you just think, how did he think of doing that? Some strikers were like foot down, head down, foot through the ball, you know, Shearer, mate of mine, Alan Shearer, and it, just laces, power, you know, side foot power. Henrik was little dinks and clever finishes. He was he was just something else. See, I mean, he's won the Liverpool game 2-0. Did you have it in your mind that he could potentially win the UEFA Cup or was it still a bit of a distance away? Ah, I think if when you're in the semis, aren't you? You're getting close, like, you know, to something, something great, you know. But uh, we fell short, but I think it was the first time since 67, since the Lions have won the European Cup, that's how like got to a major final. So, yeah, fell a little bit short at the final hurdle. Extra time, 10 men with the Bobo had been sent off. So, um we pushed them close, but just shows you what a good team they were. And they won the Champions League the next season with Mourinho, yeah. Porto. So, um, great night, great memories, but uh, hard one to take. How was it after the Boa Vista game when Larson scored? What was going oh, through your mind? Just, just hang on. It was a shocking game. They didn't play particularly well. We didn't play particularly well. Henrik scores a scruffy goal. He didn't score many scruffy goals, but it was a scruffy goal, and it was just kind of just don't concede and let's just get through. So. You'd imagine the elation in the dressing room. John Robertson, assistant manager, having a fag in the dressing room after the game, which he would never do. It was just mental pandemonium. And then on the obviously to Seville, did you realise how you obviously knew how strong the Celtic fans were, but Seville was a different ball game. There must be over a hundred thousand people there to to then support a club that from Scotland, especially the size of the population here. That it was unbelievable. I was in Seville, unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Unbelievable. I think it was playing trains and automobiles, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I think, you know, I, I, people often say, you know, if John Hartson had been fit, we could have, we could have won because you could have had, you could have had Hartson and, and Larson up front. Sutton could have dropped in a bit deeper. Or you never know, but big John could, because he scored big goals in big games, John, whether it was all firm games, European games, he got through against Celta Vigo earlier on in the cup run to Seville. So who knows what would have happened if the big fella had been fit. Were you sick before that game? Oh, every game I was sick. I, I, I used to change my pre-match meal. I would try beans on toast. I would just try toast with a banana and then didn't matter what I had, I was I was spewing up. How do you plan for that kind of game before that, for you mentally or any player? I, I Everybody's just, different, I'd imagine, but for yourself? It was it was just like any any big game, really. It was you just you've got a routine that you stick to, you know, and uh, try and do the same things. Tough thing with, with, with evening kickoff, you've got all day to think about it, you know. So you've just got to try and not use up your nervous energy and just try and get your head down if you can and eat the right stuff and get plenty of fluids on board because it was a hot night over there, wasn't it? Yeah. Of so um, I, it was great memories. And even like the night before training at the stadium, they just put a new pitch down. So even the pitch wasn't as good as you would expect for a major final. You could see the joins and stuff, but. Uh, there's no excuse on the night. I thought the pitch played all right, but uh, that was just normal preparation for a big game. What was it? What was it like afterwards? Because you were still going for the title as well, coming home after that to feel that like that's a mega loss. That knowing that you could never be in a European, well, potentially never going to be in a European Aye, final again. It's, it's a tough one to get over in it, and then like you say, you're still going for the title as well. We played. I don't know how many games we played that season, but we played a lot. Um, and then you've just got to try and get up for it. But we fell short. So we didn't win a trophy that season, even though we had a great result in Europe and stuff like that. We ended up without a trophy, which was phenomenal, really, when you look back on it, that we didn't win a trophy, but uh, still great memories. How was it? Is it last game of the season you lost the Liga? I lost at Kilmarnock, aye, last game of the season. So the Goal difference? Goal difference, aye. So we pushed them all away. And like you say, it was a decent Rangers team, that. And then... Uh, was a hard one to take. You got Seville, that was hard to take. Losing the league at Kilmarnock and then you got the other one when we lost the league last game of the season at Muller. Well, that was another tough one to take. Probably That's probably the toughest one out of the three of them. That, that Scott, helicopter Sunday when Scott, Scott McDonald scored two. I, that one sticks in the throat more than Seville and Kilmarnock. I. Did he ever get a stick for coming to Celtic after doing that? When he came to I, I wasn't here when he came to Celtic left, then. So I, was, I, wasn't, I, was, I was down the road by then, mm. so... I'm assuming he would have got some stick. I I know he scored goals for Celtic, but I don't think the Celtic fans ever forgot what he'd done to all that day. That was a fucking mad game. I was in the airport when that happened. <sighs> Couldn't believe Celtic it. Celtic won no, yeah. And we'll he win, won we'll each we'll then win, two one. We'll win him one nil. Yeah. I think the the trophy was on the helicopter. You know, it was like getting towards <laughs> fucking fur park where we were. Next thing they scored two goals in five minutes. Well, McDonald's scores two goals in five minutes. Fucking helicopter turns around and goes to Edinburgh because Rangers have won the league. 
So I've had to get the trophy over to them instead of us. So. How do you deal with that then? Because you know how much it's, the hatred is proper here. So yeah. the stick you're going to get for that, not just the heartbreak of losing the league, but the rivalry, the, the stuff that's going to come with that. Aye. Oh, it was everything that comes with it. But even after the game, the gaffer didn't even say hardly anything in the dressing room. You know, five minutes ago, one nil up, we're winning the title. And you concede two in five minutes. So the dressing room was just flat. But we had the Scottish Cup final the following Saturday. So we knew we had the Scottish Cup final, but after the game, Martin didn't say much. He, but he, what he did say was, next Saturday is my last game and then I'm leaving. His wife had been diagnosed with cancer, so he was he was leaving his job. So not only would lost the league, the gaffer tells us he's leaving and the Cup final next Saturday is going to be his last game. So it was a lot of emotions. How was that Cup final? It was shite. Um, it was a tough week, being honest. It was a really tough week getting up for it after losing the league. We won not one nil. We beat Dundee United one nil. We scraped through. Um, I scored the winning goal, but it, it was it was even after the final. I don't think we celebrated what you should celebrate a Scottish Cup when you should properly enjoy it. But the Sunday before at Motherwell was still stuck in my throat. How was that when Martin O'Neill left? Because I know he tried to take you to Leicester, then eventually took Aye. you to Celtic. Yeah. But does that change? You want to beat a team or not when the manager goes? I obviously, it was a tough one for me because he brought us in, he gave us a new contract after three years when I was here, so he looked after as well, you know, um, so it was tough when he left, um, but you've got to get on with it, I still had a couple of years left in my contract, so obviously I still wanted to carry on playing, but Gordon Stratton comes in then and wasn't long after that I was I was moved on, so. How did you get on with Wee Stratton? I got on alright with him, he was completely different to Martin what I was talking about Martin before Martin being a manager you know an old school manager Gordon was more of a coach he liked getting out on the training ground and putting his ideas across you know so he had young lads he had Malo Sean Maloney coming through Aidan McGeady coming through and I was 33 nearly 34 and um, he just wanted to move us on so it was off your pop you know How was we learning at Celtic? Lenny was great he was great um, obviously he was he wasn't a Stillian Petrov, he was he was his own man, you know, you know, sideways and backwards. I used to call him the crab. He, he fucking hated it. He hated it when I called him the crab. So uh nah, he was great. It was, you know, like many of the lads in that dressing room were winners, you know. How is it to see that like, when you're getting bullets through the post and attacked on the sidelines? Like, don't get me wrong, like nobody should get act like that, but he does bring a lot of shit on himself as well, that like, the way he can act Aye. sometimes. But how is that for a a, a fellow player to see that happen? It's it's not nice to see that happening, you know, bombs getting delivered in the post and stuff like that to him and his his legal team and bullets and that night when we're in the Drake in the in the West End of Glasgow then the plain clothes police come in and say, Right, lads, put your pints down to me and Lenny. Your life's in imminent danger and you think, how does he deal with this? Got rushed out the pub and put into two separate unmarked police cars and took the two safe houses, you know. It's like my life wasn't in danger, I don't think, but his his was, they'd been tipped off. So he dealt with a lot of shit, but like you say, he brought a lot of shit on himself, you know, if, um with his background and stuff like that. And yeah. but you don't you don't you don't wish that on anyone. How were they before the old firm games like Martin O'Neill and Neil Lennon? Because they're proper Celtic men, Matt. Oh I there, there. Do you feel the, that? The, Do they feel the the rise and energy from them compared to another game? I I think if you think they know what it means, you know, from being back home in Northern Ireland. If you if you cut them, they'd be green and white blood. If you cut me, I'd be black and white blood. Newcastle, so they're they're through and through Celtic boys, and uh, obviously they knew what it was all about more than most. Because when him was it him Lennon and McCoy? I suppose they fought, started fighting in the middle of the park. Aye, they had a fallout on the side of the pitch, the two of them. So obviously, Coisty being a big uh, Rangers man and Lenny being a big Celtic man, they were full at it. Aye. What do you think then when you see all that like when you obviously at Parkhead when you're playing for Celtic at an old firm game like do you feel a better energy when you go to Ibrox do you feel obviously the support of the fans or is it just nerve wracking I just I loved it I buzzed off the uh, whether it was over at Ibrox or whether it was at uh, Celtic Park I, I just loved that atmosphere I loved the tension between the fans listen there was respect between the players no doubt about that but it's uh it's, it's, I mean, there was one tackle. It was in the first five minutes of it. I've never seen it before. I went for a 50 50 with Alex Ray. And the, the noise, the ball burst. I'm honestly, I'd have to, I've, never, I've not watched it back. I'll have to try and find the footage. It was a blocked tackle and it wasn't, no, no nothing dirty. He went in full, I went in, in full, both at the same time, bang, and the ball burst. It was like, there was just, no, everyone wanted a win, do you know what I mean? It was just bizarre, but, uh, 
Aye, some great rivalries there, man. Mental. Who's the best player you played with at Celtic? Um, Henrik would uh, Henrik would be the standout one. But I was saying last night, someone asked us the same question. It where I was at the gig last night, and people like Jackie McNamara don't get the credit they deserve. You know, Jackie was a wonderful, wonderful player, great lad. Um, Jackie Jos Falharan never gets a mention. Lubo Moravchek, what a player Lubo was. Um, you didn't know if he was left footed or right footed Lubo. He was just that talented. And Zinedine Zidane said he was the best player I ever played with, you know. So Zinedine Zidane saying that about Lubo, that just tells you how good he was as well. But Henrik would be the standout one. Yeah, Lubo came from nowhere. I know. Nowhere. Was it Venglos or somebody? It was, I think it was uh, Venglos and brought it, him in. And I think it was, his first game was the old firm game. I think he scored a double and he just didn't know what to do. Like, oh, man. People are thinking, who is this fucking guy? I mean, I think he was 36 when I come. Yeah. I think when I joined, I was about 27. He was like 36 and he was like, he was an absolute magician with the ball. What was Big Bobo like? Was he a proper nutcase? Oh, he was a headbanger. He was a, he was a headbanger, Bobo. Um, but you'd rather have him in your team than than another team, you know? So I think he put the frighteners up the opposition. How tall was he? He was probably about 6'3", but 6'7", with his studs. His studs were like that. So um, <clears throat> I was intimidating the big fella. Who was it he was fighting with in the tunnel? I think it was Motta, wasn't it? Motta from uh, Barcelona. And uh, but uh, Bobo and Motta were fighting, but big Rab Douglas got involved in it, tried to split it up. Motta got red carded and Rab Douglas got red carded. Bobo got away with it, but he started the fight. But uh, he wouldn't mess with it. Fair play to uh, Motta, by the way, for having a go with him. What was the story you scoosed Mourinho with Lucasid? Oh, aye, that was at Seville at half time. They'd just gone 1 0 up, so, uh, Porto. And uh, obviously, massive game in it, the UEFA Cup final. And there was a big fracas at half time going down the tunnel, and Mourinho's getting involved. And he wasn't that well known then, Mourinho. It was only after Porto when he goes to Chelsea, and the rest is history then. He wasn't that well known. I'm thinking, what the f what does he think? He is like, you know, in his suit, all giving it the big one, and that. And I'm, you know how hot it was in Seville. I've got the look to say, and I thought, fucking you chirpy bollocks. And boom, boom. <laughs> Luca said straight in his coupe one, like, I thought, I'd have a bit of that. So I'd done a runner then, because it all kicks off. <laughs> I sat in the dressing room thinking, where's all the lads? They were all sorting the, uh, the scrap out that I'd just caused, and I'd done a runner, put the hand grenade in and bolted. What was the best trophy for you to win at Celtic? What was the one that stands out for you? Um, probably the winning the title in my first season, when we went on to win the treble. That's, that's probably the standout one. Eh? Your first ever trophy? Aye. I, um, I mean, I won the championship with Bolton, but... Yeah, the playoff? Did you not score? No, no we, we won the play. We beat Redden 4-3 in the playoff final at Wembley. Yeah. Uh, that was, that, that, what a way to get promoted that is in the in uh -huh. the playoff final. But we won we won the league. I think we scored over 100 goals and 100 points. So well, that was that was probably my first trophy, but uh, that was great winning my first one at Celtic. Yeah, nine trophies, man. It's not bad going. Aye, all right. Aye, I mean, you think that the two titles we lost as well, one by a point and one by a goal, um, they, they could have been two more titles there. And that still stings? Aye, slightly, aye. And then I won one when I come back with Lenny as a coach, the first one in nine in a row. So I played my little part in that nine in a row as well. So it was nice to win, win a title as a coach as well. Who was the best Rangers player you played against? Um, do you know what? There was a few. I thought, I thought Michael Moles was a good player. Um, shot or other lads he was a good player Kinija Pro Ronald De Boer was probably the standout one you listen he played for Barcelona and Holland. how many caps for Holland so Ronald was a top player as well yeah cause Cla who, who was Rangers goal at that time Klaus, Klaus Stefan Klaus was Doug McGregor there at the time as well he was a young kid coming through Greg Z I think I so um, I Klaus I think I think Paul Lambert played with Klaus at Dortmund didn't he when, yeah. when they won the Champions League because they were pally Paul Lambert what a player aye brilliant Brilliant. I was just talking to someone yesterday about him and uh, I keep in touch with Paul. He's a great lad. Everyone thinks he's all dour and serious, but he's one of them in the dressing room. He's a dark horse, do you know what I mean? Oh, proper, is he? Oh, proper dark horse, Lambo. But um, they said, oh, do you know how he come about? He went to um, Borussia Dortmund. I went, no. They said, oh, Borussia Dortmund. We're playing Motherwell in a, in a pre-season friendly at Motherwell. And he played well for Motherwell and that was how he signed for Dortmund. So um, you don't listen big move like that and then you win the Champions League so it just tells you what a top player he was and he was one of our main players winning that Champions aye, League aye. I remember him I think he was coming to Celtic and the Dortmund fans I think sung was it walk on I think they did man and it was, it was they unbelievable they'll get great fans as well the Germans aye because aye. even when you were at Celtic those years as well Celtic seemed to do well in Europe 
well, for what they could from a Scottish club. Like he's, he, you scored against Barcelona, the victory, yeah. and Juventus. Like Celtic got some. It just seems to be so fucking distanced now. Those kind of results. Like. Aye, I know it's mental. We, we we did. We played some top teams. Um, like you mentioned, Barcelona. What was that like um, for you? Oh, brilliant! Look, first twenty minutes, I'm looking around. I'm saying Eleni and Petrov and stuff like that. Do you feel like I feel? Couldn't catch me breath. They were that sharp. Couldn't get the ball. Thought we we need to keep this down to single figures. Never mind. You know, could be a cricket score. Luckily, we hung on to them, and then uh, it was ten v nine at the end because there'd been three red cards, and I managed to nick a goal towards the end. How was that feeling? Oh, brilliant, mate. Brilliant, and. Uh, I got Ronaldinho's strip that night as well. So how was he as a player? Probably the best. Probably the best that I played against. He was just he had everything. Quick, powerful, first touch, skillful, score goals, make goals. He was he was he was right up there. So I was buzzing when I got his top that night. When the fans watch it, you you know whose players you, you go, wow, he's world class. Do you feel that as well when there's hype against somebody you see on the telly when you go up oh, against I, them? I, it's it's not until you get on the pitch and you see, you know, Kaka playing for uh, AC Milan, you know, what a player, and uh, Xavi playing for Barcelona, Iniesta, and you just think, he's a world class. You know, you just says all says everything about Henrik getting a move to Barcelona to get in that team, win the Champions League with him. Is, uh, but to play against some of the players I played against, you know, in England, Thierry Henry, Vieira, Scholes, Gerard Giggs, they're just top players. And then you've got an England call-up. I got a call up in 2003. One Rightly cap, fucking so, one, one, like, one cap wonder. You and Sutton should have got a, a, a call up. Mm. Like, the run that Celtic went on in the European football stuff, like, you should have got a cap earlier because the talent was showing that you were scoring Aye. goals against world class teams. And obviously, Big Sutton, I, I think he fucked off the, the FA. I think he wanted he, to play for the B team or something. He fell out with Glenn Hoddle, didn't he? He fell out with Glenn Hoddle when yeah. Glenn Hoddle was the manager. So, so I, I think, think he was fucked anyway. There was a bit of politics yeah. involved with Sutty, whereas with me, I just, I didn't seem to get the opportunity. I think I was, I think I was 30 by the time I got my call up. So, yeah, I think it's probably a bit of politics involved with Sutty, whereas with me, I just, I didn't seem to get the opportunity. I think I was, I think I was 30 by the time I got my cap. So, yeah. Uh, would have been nice to get a few more, but I'm happy with the one. Why do you think that is? Because you're playing in Scotland? I think, like you say, you're playing in Scotland. I think they think that the standard's not as good. But we were, we were playing in Europe every season. Do you know what I mean? Whether it was Champions League or UEFA Cup at the time. So we were still playing proper teams at good levels and, you know, but I, I just think it was, the manager at the time was Sven Goran Eriksson. He's too busy probably shagging Ulrika. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, you say what the fuck you want, bro. It's anything goes, mate. It's, who was playing left mid for England at that time? There was a shortage, you know. There wasn't there wasn't that many uh, kicking about at the time, really. Um, so it wasn't like they had a wealth of talent. You look at the England team now, they've got talent in abundance. So it wasn't even like they had, you know, loads of players that they could pick from. There was there was a severe shortage of left-siders at the time. Um, I mean, the night I played, uh, the, the left-back who's, who's, who played all in the big games for England at the time was Ashley Cole. He didn't play that night. They played, uh, they played Jamie Carragher. To be fair to Jamie Carragher, in my opinion, he wasn't a left back. He was a centre off, wasn't he? Yeah. That was where he played his trade for Liverpool centre off. And Ericsson played him left back that night behind us. So it would have been nice if Ashley Cole had been playing left footed and both linking up together. Whereas Jamie Carragher, to be fair to Jamie, I thought he was a centre off and not a left back. You know, even though he could do it, but it would have been nice to have had a yeah. you know a tried and tested left back behind us was that a big moment in your career getting the England call up oh massive I. I mean you know you look who was in the team that night Rooney started Gerard, Jonathan Woodgate who was not long back from Real Madrid John Terry um, you know some top players in there so I obviously a proud night and my Celtic teammate Johan Mialbi was playing for um, Sweden that night as well so I was it was now nah, it was great we lost the game but um, still a proud moment when you when you pull the pull the pull the Jersey on the you know national team, so brilliant. Did you expect another call up after that? Uh, no, I don't think I did. I think I think I didn't play particularly well. Um, so no, I, don't, I wasn't going to hold my breath. That was for sure. So, what age did you leave Celtic? Thirty three. Thirty three went to Leeds for a year. Then I I chucked it at thirty four. How was that leaving Celtic for you? Tough, really tough. Um, but listen, I'd had six great years, like you say, nine trophies, some unbelievable memories. So. All good things come to an end, but it was a wrench. It was a wrench, I'm not going to lie, and I missed it. Um, but still, I went to Leeds and I had 12 great months there. What was it like at Leeds? 
It, do you know what? It wasn't it wasn't the Leeds of old where they get the Champions League semi final and got all the top players that they had. It was it was a it was a bad time in the history of Leeds. They went um, they went to the wall, and uh, the, you know it was a tough time. You know it was Championship, and then they get relegated to League One. Um, not where you want Leeds to be. So it's great when you look at them now back in the Premiership because it's a big club. Why did you retire so early? Do you know what? Dennis Wise left Leeds and he went to Newcastle as a director of football. And he obviously knew I lived in Newcastle. I travelled up and down to Leeds uh, every day. And uh, I think Dennis knew that. I was I was kind of getting towards the end of my tether. My coughs kept pulling up. I was injured quite a bit at Leeds. And uh, he was director of football at Newcastle. He knew I had a house in Newcastle. I lived in Newcastle. And he offered us a coaching job. So I just thought, and I chance to go into coaching, which I wanted to do. Um, Again, back to my hometown club, you know, the, me, the club I loved. And uh, so I, I just chucked it at 34. Looking back on it now, maybe could have given it another season, two seasons and and played for a Hartlepool or a Carlisle or something like that and just enjoyed my football. But I decided to go down the coaching route, maybe looking back, maybe a bit too early. Is that, because footballers' careers don't last forever. Is that a stage though when you're playing football, you never think it will end? <sighs> you know, you've, you've been there yourself, James, and you do. You think this is never going to end. You think, you know, you've got enough money to last your lifetime and all that. And little do you know, man, goes like that. Not just the money, <laughs> time. Yeah. Um, so I, you think it's going to go on forever, but it doesn't, you know. How hard was it? Like, back then, a lot of the youth players used to get chances, but now it seems a bit dried up with kids. They don't really get many chances. I think a lot of foreign players now, especially in the UK, kind of drown that out. But... Was that a lot easier for when you see young kids coming through as well, that to see the talent that they got chances compared yeah. to now? Ah, it's difficult, isn't it? I think I think it's value for money, isn't it? You get a good young English player, British player, whether it's Irish, Scottish, Welsh, the price tag seems to go through the roof. So a lot of these a lot of these clubs now do their do their recruitment abroad, you know. So it's uh, frustrating for young lads, I guess, coming through nowadays. But uh, ah, it's tough. What does a football player do then? What did you do once you kind of hung up the boots and? Um, well, I went down the coaching route and uh, I don't know, try and get the golf clubs out and get involved in charity boxing and get me balls punched in. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it becomes a big void to training every day, surrounded with the boys, just having a laugh and making a bit of money. That is, do you think there's enough things in football to try and help somebody with like, mental health side of things when you give up a, a, such a big void? I, th I think there should be more. I think obviously Tony Adams has set up his Sport and Chance Clinic, which I got in touch with uh, last year to get some help for, you know, a bit of mental health problems, depression and stuff like that. Um, I think it's coming more to the fore now, people talking about it than what it was, say, 15, 20 years ago. And I think, you know, people need it. Not not just footballers, you know, sportsmen in general. Um some sportsmen go on to, you know, the golfers and the snooker players, you know, you look at John Higgins and Lee Westwood and stuff like that. They can go on to the mid 40s as they are now, late 40s. Footballers, there's not many go past 35 if you think about it, really. You know, you've still got hopefully 40, 50 years left living. Like, you know, there's a long time after that. And I think there should be more to help sports people who finish at early ages to deal with that void. How do you deal with it back then, like 90s, early 2000s? When you were feeling it, did you? Because it wasn't really spoken about then, mental health. Mm. Obviously, when Gary Speed, I don't know what year that was. Um, that would have been about 2011, I think. Yeah. yeah, so over 10 years ago. But even before then, like, you never really spoke about mental health. I imagine, because I've listened to you speak before, and you talk about in the changing room, you're getting a punch off the players and a slap and locked in fucking uh, the boot room and stuff. Like, you yeah. can't do that shit now, man. You get the jail. Oh, but, without a doubt. But then, how did you deal with like, the dark periods of your life? Get like getting sent off or losing a final? Was it just a case of boots back on? And... I, I, I think when I when I played, you know, obviously you, you lose games and you you, go, you get on a downer about it, or you have a bad game, you get on a downer. Lasts a couple of days, you know what I mean. But I think when when you're talking about getting down in the dumps and depressed and having the black dog and stuff like that, you know yourself when it when it stopped lasting for two, three, four, five, six years, that's when you're in trouble. But I think when you play you kind of dust yourself down quite quickly. I mean, I, I didn't suffer with depression when I played. Um, Lenny Lenny suffered with it massively when he played and and after playing. But I used to look at Lenny and think, well, 
do you need the medication and stuff like that? And he speaks openly about it, Lenny. But it was only when I finished playing did it start setting in with me. When I, when I played, I kind of dusted myself off quite quickly. Was there many players struggle with mental health back then? Um, no, be, well, it would probably be something that would be spoken about with a doctor or a you know or the manager or something like that. Um, I know Merce Merce went through it himself. You know everything Merce went through in his career with his gambling and his and his drugs and his drink and stuff like that. So, um, but it wasn't something that you talk about openly. Um, Lenny Lenny did to a certain extent to to his people he was close to. He was close to myself and um, John Arts and Sutty, um, Paul Lambert. He'd, he'd speak to his close friends, but he wouldn't talk about it to a journalist like he would now or, or a podcast or something like that like he would now. So it's definitely more to the front now than what it, what it was then. Yeah, do you feel as if they had to be more closed off because he got it more, worse than anybody really, any? Aye. Like, did you, was that a telltale sign that you could tell that he was struggling? I would say so, aye, but it, it was kind of like, it just, it, you, you weren't admitting anything or you weren't admitting defeat. It was something that you just, you 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 wouldn't talk about it like you know what i mean so but you could you could tell when he got down it was he was down for a while you know and it would affect his performances in training he wouldn't be his normal self you know you could tell when he was when he was good he was good but when he was bad he was flat as a fart you know what was roy Keane like when he came to celtic roy wasn't there very long because i was probably only in there about six weeks when roy was there so i don't think he played very often did he he didn't didn't play as many games as he wanted so I'm not sure if Gordon Strachan was the manager at the time. I don't know if Gordon Strachan brought him in or if it was Desmond, the the, the, the main shareholder, who brought him in. Because normally if you sign a player as a manager, you're going to play him, aren't you? As Gordon signs Roy or Dermot signs Roy and Gordon didn't end up using Roy very often. So I think Roy was a bit peeved off, like, you know, that he, he's come to his boyhood club Celtic and he, he didn't play much. But later on in his career, though, isn't he? I, I, I remember having a chat to Roy and he was, he was saying his hip was knackered. You know, he was really struggling with his hip and that's why he left United. So um, I don't think he was as fit as what he was. Yeah, did he not write a book but when he says he walked onto the bus and he seen Big Hearts eating a packet of crisps or drinking a can of juice and says, welcome to hell or some shit? Oh, aye, aye. He was like, what am I dealing with? Yeah, <laughs> just, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't happen at Man United. Right. But um, no, Big John had his own diet, man. He just ate what he wanted, the big fella. Yeah, he doesn't give a fuck. What a fucking player, Big Hearts. Oh, he's Big Hearts. Oh, he's a great, great, great fella. Guy, man. I speak to John regular. He's a he's a smashing fella. He must have had some time in that Arsenal team when he was a kid with Mercer and Tony Adams and all that. Man, he's got some great stories. How was it back then? Because then players seemed to go out and drink a lot. I know that uh, I had Andy Gorham on. He says look, there used to be a day. I think it was a Tuesday or Wednesday, and everybody used to go out and get pissed. Aye, but it's kind of changed now you don't really see that but but I believe team bonding is just as important as anything like, was there a lot of that then a lot of boozing with the Celtic team Ah, it wasn't it wasn't regular but if we didn't have a midweek game you know the lads would go out if, if we had Wednesday off and back in on Thursday they'd probably get out go out and a few beers on the Tuesday night like but it wasn't like um, it wasn't every Tuesday if we didn't have a midweek game because uh, but we would get together and the gaffer would encourage, encourage us to go and get together and Enjoy yourselves, you know. How was uh, Cy Ferry at Celtic? Cy was great. He's funny, a funny, funny bastard, boy, man. Mate, aye. Makes us laugh, makes us laugh. He's done well for himself, hasn't he? Yeah, class, he's man. Having uh, we slain him. By man. the way, he's nearly as bad as you to get all of on the phone, though. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now. I don't know who's worse you were <laughs> uh, For the younger team, because big beating that was coming through as well. That, did you see the talent aye, coming beats. through? Aye, there was, there, was, there was a good group. Kenny McDowell was the coach at the time, and he had a good group. Ross Wallace, Aidan McGeary. Sean Maloney, John Kennedy, uh, Beats, as you mentioned. Um, so I do a good Simon Ferry. But um, oh, we used to have some crack with them lads, man. How like, really a Muller man, God rest his soul, that like, he was at Parkhead. See, when you retire as well and you see that happening to other players, Petrov, Liam Muller, that like, does that Stub, make you make, make, your big stubs there? Like, when you heard about Liam Muller, like, how just, does just that affect try, a player? You, you, you just. Just defies belief. Someone Fernando Rickson, man, you know, someone yeah. so so young and so fit, how it can just strike him down. It just and like Big John, you know, Big John was a lucky boy that he survived what he went through. John yeah. Orton, and he's, he's got that foundation now, which is you know he's raised over a million quid, and it's it's great that they can give something back. But someone so, as young as Liam, I think he was still playing, you know, to, to be struck down like that's just tragic. Same as uh, Petrov, leukemia. Still in, yeah. Now, see, at Aston Villa when that happened? Aye, aye, he was at Villa, yeah. Couldn't believe it when I got the call. 
you just think someone so young and so fit just touch wood they got through you know does that put you in a, a dark space or do you not really you just kind of got on with it I just for me it just kind of made us appreciate how, how lucky I was like you know coming back from breaking my neck at 16 and getting back fit and going on to play over 500 games in my career and that it just makes you pinch yourself and think how lucky you've been you know how was Rexon playing against oh he was tough he was tough listen he was he was a hard bastard but he was he weren't dirty he, you know he was, he was never going to top you or something like that you know you might might give you the odd pinch and nip here and all that kind of shit like but uh i was a tough opponent and god rest his soul i yeah it's sad to see a man against mm -hmm. what happened to Rexon. who was it had the fireworks him he put like... the fireworks through me fucking letterbox <laughs> that's not normal is it <laughs> unless funny. unless there's something to do in holland like but it's yeah. not something to do in there uh, in newcastle or glasgow where did they put the fireworks through your letterbox i put some kind of bangers through me letterbox and that I, mean, I had three young kids at the time you know one of them could have been walking past uh -huh. saying that it was in the middle of the night like and then another occasion he comes knocking on the door with his dog big bull mastiff i'm out the bedroom window it's like half two in the morning i'm like fernando take your dog home walk back round and if you want to have a roll around on the grass we'll have a roll around but I'm not coming down while that dog's there fucking rip me head off but uh, I was a character why was he doing that because he wanted to fight well there was when he when he come round with a dog it was um, we had an old firm game that afternoon and I don't know if you remember it Big Sutty scored a chip he chipped Stefan Kloss at the end uh, I think we won 1-0 and it was a great goal from Sutty he didn't score many good goals so he just but, <laughs> but that, that was one good goal and as I'm running back to the halfway line to kick off them, they're kicking off because we've just scored I've given him a little one of them on the face where he's seen the red mist hasn't he so he's obviously gone out after the game had a few beers and thought right because I lived on the same street so he's obviously thought I'm going round there because that twat slap was on the face you know so yeah I come round with a dog <laughs> <laughs> I, had to ring, I had to ring Ronald the Boer. Ronald lived opposite us. I had to ring Ronald, wake him up in the middle of the night and tell Ronald, Ronald, you need to get rid of your pal, yeah? Outside my door with his dog. That's fucking So Ron, I see Ronald coming to the front door and telling him in Dutch to go home and get to bed. Were you in contact with many Rangers players? Ronald, I used to play a bit of golf with Ronald, but, you know, they haven't got the best sense of humour, them Dutch players, have they? Um, but uh, nah, Ronald was all right, aye. How was Big Desmond? Big Dermot? I was good. We didn't see much of him, to be fair. Um, he'd pop in after a European game and all that. He'd bring all his mates in and get them all the top off the floor and all that. Much to the kit man's disgust. But um, no, we didn't see that much of him, really. Do you miss it? I, 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 do you know what, James? When I, when I stopped playing in 2008 and went to Newcastle coaching, I missed it for a couple of years. I wanted to join in training with the under 18s so I was coaching and I thought I could still do it, you know. And for a couple of years, I did miss it and then... Like, gradually the fire went out a little bit and you get used to it you know what changing room was the best oh that Celtic one was brilliant mate that was that would take some beating I mean the Villa one was full of egos full of good players but uh, in terms of lads and the crack the Celtic one was top notch does that come down to manager or just I think it comes down to, to manager and you know it was uh, we policed the dressing room ourselves really we didn't need Martin to, to police it and but his assistant manager, John Robertson, his first team coach, Steve Wolfer, they were a big part in it. They were always in the dressing room. They were in there in the crack, you can imagine. If you want anything to get back to the gaffer, you tell Robbo and Wally, you know, they're going straight back to tell him. So we'd tell him that he's got his formation wrong and all that kind of shit, that we need to change the team on Saturday and all that. So. And Mark O'Neill, he only picked a team like 60 minutes, 90 minutes before a game? I would just come in about an hour and five minutes before the game kicks off and tell with the team very rarely did he name his team the day before you're not fucking sitting on edge every game Um, I I mean I knew I was playing most of the time no, I'm only joking <laughs> um, I you off because you're thinking am I in am I out you know what I mean And mm -hmm. um, so I it was it was tough Um, some managers like to name that team on a Thursday or work on a team shape on a Tuesday and before a Saturday but Martin just wasn't one of them how was we Bobby Peter? Bobby Pratt, brilliant man, great lad. Uh, Did you play in the Ajax game? Or was that no, I was, I was suspended. I got sent off. Is that a 3-0 game or something? What a fucking game. Celtic came out the trap uh, flying. I the one, did they win 3-0 Over Celtic there, Park? yeah. Um, I, I think they won 2-0 over there. I was suspended because I'd been sent off just before I signed for Celtic. Got sent off for Villa mm -hmm. in the UEFA Cup. So I was suspended for the Ajax game. I was there, I travelled across, but I didn't play. But he was brilliant, Bobby. I used to call him Bobby Prada. Because everything, everything he wore was Prada. Brilliant. Any underpants, socks, everything was Prada. Mm -hmm. I seen him a couple of years ago and I says to him, Bobby, where's the Prada gear? 
oh no don't don't buy that anymore Tom I went ah Bobby Zara now he is <laughs> <laughs> I think he's doing his DJing in that now I was playing a charity game with him uh, he's doing alright apparently he's, always, he's doing alright yeah, 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 yeah. apparently he's yeah, doing he's really well, well man, but is that hard though to try and because people think football players are they're sorted for life look it's a great wage but you're not taking away the 60% tax and all the other fucking overheads that you've got like is it still retirement where you can go I can have a good life or is it still I still need to do bits and um, bobs I've, after I've, I've had a tough ride and I talk about it in the book financially I had a massive tax case um, not through any fault of my own it was my advisors put us into this this film scheme thing that I know it's hit a lot of people hard and so listen I've got a I've got a super pension but I'm, I've got to be 55 till I get my pension I've got another six years so um that wiped me out that uh that tax scheme which was a nightmare so now nah, it's kind of just trying to get back on your feet again you know and, yeah. who's the uh, best manager you've played under um I'd say Martin O'Neill yeah, yeah without a doubt I what yeah. made them special um you just knew what you were going to get off them you know you, you you could you could read when you could when you could speak to him. You could read when don't go knocking on his door. Do you know if he's left you out? Don't go knock on his door today because he's on one type of thing. And he he was just as honest as a day's long. Where some managers you feel like when you go in the office they're just talking shite. Do you know what I mean? They say certain things just to keep you happy. Did you ever you know? have any animosity? Animosity with any players, Celtic players? Um, he didn't like that. I don't like that bastard. No, not really. Um, I think Craig Bellamy come in and. I knew Bella. I didn't know him personally, but I knew of him because he was at Newcastle. And you've got the image of people because you've seen them on the pitch. You know, horrible little son and all that. But when he come in, he was actually all right, Bella's. But no, I didn't dislike many people. Um, opponents or people I played with, really. So uh, I was just kind of a yeah. happy-go-lucky character. Because I had Shea given on, and he says Bellamy was always fighting and arguing with someone. Hated, I, the, him and Shearer, Shearer hated each other. They did. They did. He, he caused a lot of hassle at, at Newcastle. But you know what? I'm, I'm surprised because that Newcastle dressing room with Shearer and Gary Speed and that, David Batty, some big characters in there. He come to Celtic and we're thinking, he's going to come in here and try and cause a bit of bollocks. But when he was at Norwich, when he was a kid, Chris Sutton was at Norwich. So I think Bellas was scared of Chris Sutton from the Norwich days. I think so he had one on him type of thing. So uh, he come in the Celtic dressing room. We didn't cause any bother at all. Like, What is Big Sutton like? Um, I know he portrays this image, doesn't he? he give it, and, you know, now, he, now he's in the media and all that. Mm -hmm. But behind closed doors, he's a good kid. He's a good lad. I uh, got to be around. What do you see when you see him online and on the TV? Like, he's, he's a big wind up merch. He was he one of them, man. James, when we we used to stay in the Hilton up the road in, in Glasgow, there, all, every every game we had, we'd stay in the Hilton. So we'd sit down, we'd drink coffee and play cards and all that. And so he would always say, You ever see me when I finish playing football? You ever see me in the media having the, you know, doing what them doing, doing what that Tosser's doing, doing what he's doing? You can smash me around the head with a baseball bat. So I seen him a couple of years ago before COVID. I'd done a gig with him up in Stirling. I said, Sooty, remember what you said to us that time, man? Eh? You can smash me around the head if I ever go into the media. But listen, he's carved his cell and niche and he's, he's good at it and he winds the Rangers fans up and all that, doesn't he? So he loves it. Big boy did does it for Rangers. Now that's all part and parcel of it. I think that stuff's getting took out of the game. I think it's becoming too soft. Aye, I think too too many people take it too serious what Boyd says and what Sooty yeah. says. And, Listen, I just look at it and laugh because I know what they're both at. You know, they're just that winding each other up. So it's funny. That is funny, man. Like, I, I laugh at both. I laugh at them all because I think, why is people getting so angry? They're getting so fucking angry about what people are saying. And it's only a, but it's it's only a, a little laugh. Like, it's a little dig. Yeah. Obviously, if your team gets beat, if your enemies get beat, you're going to fucking wind up. Exactly. I've fell out with family members and family Aye. members and friends for months I know. because of a certain result. Mm. It's just the way it is, man. I think that's where... Obviously, when it comes to the violence kind of thing, you don't want to see that, but the rivalry and the, everything and, and in the, the 90 minutes that, is what you want nah, to Of course it is, and uh, that needs to stay involved. And like you say, too many people take it too serious, man. How was it? Did you play in the testimonial for Wee Petrov? Uh, no, I didn't play in that one. I wasn't so good at the time, so I, uh, I didn't play. Do you miss that? Not able to kick a ball now? Um, I've done a few charity things, but you know, your head thinks you can do it and then you go on the pitch, you realise you're two stone heavier. You haven't got much power in your legs and it's kind of like, I think you can make yourself look a bit stupid because you're nowhere near what you used to be 15, 20 years ago, you know, so I've tend to, uh, I tend to avoid it now. I got a text yesterday about playing in one in Dublin in June and I'm like, 
fucking nearly 50, do you know what I mean? James, it's kind of like, I'll, <laughs> I'll, just make myself, I'll just make myself look a prick, uh -huh. you know? The left foot still works, but I just can't run. Was there, Who was the most dedicated at Celtic? Was there players used to stay over? Like after training, or was it just... I, there, was a, there was a handful, to be fair. Uh, Stillian was only a young lad then. He was, Stillian worked his socks off. Um, Lenny, believe it or not, Lenny Lenny was a good trainer, so I... It was a, it was a, now nah, we, we looked after ourselves back then, to be fair. Did they struggle to keep the weight off, Lenny Hartson? Because you, you just know that. Well, we're big football, John, we're, we're big John. He's not doing himself any favours. He's eating 25 packets of hula hoops before a game, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, a couple, couple of the lads, I was, I was all right when I was, when I was younger. I tend to eat what I wanted, drink what I wanted without putting weight on. So I was, I was, I was quite lucky, but, uh, got a bit more fucking not that <laughs> lucky now. You come back to Celtic for a second stint uh, as a coach, won the league. How was that experience for you? Aye, brilliant. Um, loved it. I was I was at Newcastle and Lenny got the job at Celtic and he said, "Listen, if I get the job, would you would you come in be my first team coach?" So when I got the opportunity, I was I jumped at it. And then when you got asked about Charlie and taking gear and that, how was that again? Experience? Just it was just bizarre because I'd spend like I'd go out with Lenny three or four times a week for a pint and something to eat or what have you. And, and then when he pulled us in his office at Lennox Town, he says to us, we've had reports that you're taking cocaine. It's like, Lenny, you spend enough time with me. You've known us for long enough to know that's not my game type of thing. And I swear on my kids' lives, I've never touched it in my life. Listen, I like to drink and the odd cigarette and stuff like that. But in terms of that, I said, Lenny, go and get the doc, mate. I'll do any drugs test you want. I hate injections for a start. I said, go and get the doc and I'll, I'll, I'll have tests. I'll do what I have to do. You know, it's a load of shite. And... I was a bit peeved with him, to be honest, that he, that, he, that he asked us in his office at the Lennox Town training ground. I thought if he was going to ask us, ask us when we've gone for a pint and, you know, in a more not official type of man I like, you know, so I was, that was kind of a little fracture between me and him when he asked us that. Well, he's, it's not a friend because it's a, your friend's off the pitch, but then he's becoming more a manager. It, and, I, he was, he was, he was Glasgow race. Celtic manager, yeah, so he's not, job. it's obviously been reported to the chief executive or something like that who said to Lenny, you need to nip this in the bud if that is the case. So he understood why he got asked to ask us, but I just thought he could have done it a little bit more subtly. More parley way. Aye, aye. And not as rough mm. as a boss. Mm. So what happens? That was that when your Celtic career ended? Uh, no, I was, I was, I was, no, I was still there uh, for a, for a bit after that. Um, was it not the same? No, it wasn't the same. And then I, I had some shite that was in the papers about me divorce and stuff like that. So it was. Um, it was wasn't a great time, and it was. It, I think it was. It was more the chief executive's uh, decision to to get rid of us then in the summer. How hard is that when everything's in the papers? Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. You can't really deal with that. that. Was when I when I left Celtic as a coach. That was when the the shit hit the fan with the depression and my marriage went you know south, and it was that was that was when it all started setting in for me because of, you know it's all public knowledge why you've been sacked and this that and you. It's it's not nice. It's not nice losing your job at any time. No matter what you do, whether that's football or not, but um, when it's made public knowledge in front pages, it's it's not nice. How did you deal with that? <sighs> Buried my head in the sand, really. Um, moved back to Newcastle and and hit a brick wall. Aye. Were you drinking more? I was drinking a lot more at the time. I too much, too much. Probably both when I was still at Celtic and 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 then when I left Celtic, probably too much. I without a doubt. How did you go over it? Um. I don't. I kind of just pulled myself round, and it was a, it was still a couple of years after I left Celtic. My mate got the Birmingham City job, and he he asked us to go into Birmingham and look after the the reserves of the under twenty ones at the time, and got back into football and cleaned myself up. I. How do you? Is that what you need to do? Is just kind of keep busy. Just kind of keeps your demons at bay. Aye, or or exercise stuff like that. You know, we'd done the boxing in October there, and you know. Bought myself a mountain bike. I bought myself a road bike years ago when I when I left Celtic just to try and get out the house. Do you know what I mean? Because you know what it's like when the when the dark days set in. You don't want to open the curtains. You don't want to answer your phone. You don't reply to messages. It's it's horrible. So I thought you get yourself a bike, get out, and I started getting into cycling and just trying to just not sit in the bedroom and watch TV and just not open the curtains. It's horrible. So just got to try and keep busy, whether it's exercise or or back doing work. You know. How are you dealing with it now? Ah, you're right. I mean, obviously, like I said, there's been tough times, but um, got in touch with Sport and Chance through Tony Adams, and uh, had some counselling, and, and uh, without a doubt, it helped. Where was it you get done for drink driving? 
Um, it was going out towards Lennox Town. I mean, it, like, was that Celtic? You were? I caught at ten in the morning, you know, <laughs> and, I, and I hadn't even had a late night. The night before, mm -hmm. I must have been in bed for midnight, possibly, and um, I was I was just driving up the Lennox Town stupidly. Um, didn't have my phone Bluetooth to the car, and I was on the phone, and the cop was pulled us for being on the phone and smelt drink. But I thought I was all right. Quarter ten in the morning. How's your luck? Did you ever get pulled with the coppers and because you were a footballer, they just kind of let you go? I just, the odd Celtic one would be all right. These, I think these other two done I think they were, they were Rangers fans. <laughs> it was a day after an old firm game as well. Did so. he's win? Uh, I'm not too sure what the result was, but uh, no, I might have got beat. Um, it was one day after an old firm game, we beat there. Uh, we were players, me and Lenny, and we went and played golf somewhere out, out west. And uh, we're teeing off on the first tee, but there's a there's a road coming in. It's the day after an old firm game. And uh, Lenny hits quite a long ball on the golf course. And this car's stopped further up, letting us play our shots. And honestly, he's hit one. It's bounced on the road. Bounced on the road and I hit, hit this car windscreen. Honestly, I was rolling around on the floor laughing. This car drives up, raging this bloke. He puts his window down. He goes, I might have fucking known it was you, you fiendian bastard. It was a Rangers fan and we just beat Rangers the day before and Lenny puts a golf ball through his window. Okay. So Did you not get the deal with, was it Megiddy? Who got the deal with Megiddy? Did somebody not get the deal with Megiddy? Um, Lenny got the jail, didn't he? With yeah. Bobby Petter and when mm -hmm. we're in Newcastle, uh, the incident in Tokyo Joe's. <laughs> I'm not sure about Megiddy. What though, happened? I think it was uh, a certain Bulgarian midfielder there was like a podium dancer, not not a strip joint. It was she had like a bikini on, mm -hmm. and a certain Bulgarian midfielder pulled a thong type of thing. So the doorman have clocked it, threw everyone out. Big Rab Douglas throws the photographer from the uh, record of the Suns camera in the River Tyne. Go to the other pub. I wasn't there. I was pissed. I'd, my dad had put me to bed. It was in Newcastle, so my dad was come to meet us for a drink. So I was in the cop throwing asleep. I missed all this. Next thing, get a knock on the door later on, sooty. Four of the boys have been locked up. And the thing is, my sister was a policewoman. The lads who got locked up, it was me, Albie, Val Haran, Bobby Petter and Lenny. It was my sister's police station in Gateshead where they got locked up. So the sergeant had said to me, sister, Jane, I think you're Alan's in one of the cells. Luckily, she looked through the cell. It was Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Oh, my God. She was like, thank fuck, that's not our Alan. Yeah. So, aye, so that caused havoc, that did. That, that was all over the papers. And I think the lads were locked up for over 24 hours man yeah but they didn't do no wrong do you know yeah. what i mean it was just a bit of banter i think it was a bit of a stitch up that the papers were there how see when you referees obviously the people say referees are biased this and that did you ever sense that that a certain referee would support a different team would give a little bit extra i i think it was um it, i think we knew who's not on our side but you, we didn't get many good any decisions i think it was it was properly bent yeah, it's, it's, it seems to get fucking worse. Aye. It aye. seems to get worse. Aye. Like People are just brazen now at getting fucking penalties it's and mental, it? sending off. It is, like, man, it's mental. It's hard to... Only that's why play. I think for the old firm games, definitely they should bring in form referees. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a great idea. I'm surprised that hasn't happened before now. Mm -hmm. Even English referees or Welsh or Irish, well, not maybe not yeah. Irish. <laughs> but, <laughs> worse, I, I, but I, I, I can't believe they haven't trialled that yeah. how was see when you see that Lenny's a good friend and then you see him getting sacked from Celtic and then you see videos of him pissed and that like, is that hard to see I, it was hard I mean I didn't when, when I got sacked in 2012 I didn't speak to Lenny for three or four years because um, of that I, because of that and you. because of that and it's a shame because you know we were really tight we were really good pals and it was only when he got the Bolton job did we get back in touch with each other you know so uh we're not best mates now i wouldn't go for a pint together but um yeah see when he got sacked i sent him a text and you know he's got my number and i said if, if you need out or you need a chat give us a shout and then you see the video of him steam and now you, you, you don't you don't you don't like that you know he's because he's a good person deep down yes yeah, that is sad but for again for all the shit he went through but when you the nine in a row and then going for ten like the wheels seem to have just fell off Celtic completely, Happened man. quick, didn't it? Uh, yeah, Happened from quick, just man. being yeah. kind of no one near us. Mm -hmm. People saying Rangers are five years, ten years ahead. Like, you've got to give Gerard his fucking due there. Like, he came in and done what a job yeah. he'd done. But the wheels totally fell. They kind of fell. I think Rangers could have won the league at nine in a row as well, though. I think it was at Christmas time and then it went, they went to Dubai. 
and they kind of fucking went mm. missing Aye. and then Celtic just mm. we were scoring a lot of last minute goals but the, the 10 in a row the wheels just they just seemed to have fell off man I don't know what happened I don't know if it was the pressure we're getting close to the 10 in a row or what have you but I think it was more than 20 points wasn't it they lost the league by yeah, when they lost the 10 in a row it was like wow it was amazing how quick it happened mm -hmm. I remember like looking at the results and thinking they've lost again and they lost games that you just didn't expect them to lose it was like the wheels properly come off quickly because they've done a great job at Celtic the first time we were in. done aye. a great job then was it him and Desmond that fell out? Yeah, I think they did, aye. aye. And then they came back again and they done what he could, but Celtic players don't Celtic fans don't really forgive either. No, no. Do you I, know was, what I, mean? I got asked about Lenny last night and um it's amazing how many of them have got negative things to say about them because listen, he had a great career as a player, and like you say, first time round he done he done good things as a manager, so a shame that some of them have that negativity towards them you know yeah. but a lot of them won't but obviously some of them will yeah even scott brown and that as well that when they lost that season he's probably he is the best for me anyway mm -hmm. the best captain celtics ever had yes you've got big billy mcneil in that but yeah. the trophies that he won and what he's achieved i think people will recognize that more maybe 10 years time aye when they look, when back, they look and back the dust kind of settles thought it would have been nice for brownie to have stayed on and being around the club in some capacity as a young as a coach coaching the, the the 23s stepping up the first team coach in a couple of years time i thought he's got a lot to give on and off the pitch brownie he's a he's a great lad to have in the dressing room i know i've worked with him um it's a shame that he's gone to aberdeen because i would have liked to have seen him being kept around celtic in some capacity i think he'll probably go back i i would like to think go he'd back. go back because yeah. he's i think he's, he'll, he'll be great in some in his some leadership role. man aye, what i've done in the aye, trophies that he won is unbelievable when you met Big Billy McNeil and that, Danny McGrain, how hard is it when they go as well? I just create lads, Dick Billy, Danny McGrain, Bertie Old, Bobby Lennox, got to play a lot of golf with Bobby Lennox and Stevie Chalmers, you know, they're just legends, aren't they? I mm. mean, you could sit and listen to them all day. John Clark was the kit man when I played and when I was coach as well. So legends of the, of the game and legends of the club and just great to sit around them and just be around them and listen to their stories and that you know yeah big ballet man do you know what tommy I tommy mean? burns was another one tommy. that was great to be around tommy was a fantastic bloke proper football man celtic through and through just great knowledge of the game you know is it good to have the old school players around the stadium all the time i i mean i used to share a desk with danny mcgrain i couldn't understand the fucking word he was saying <laughs> danny though i didn't know <laughs> put danny and peter beersley around the table together that would be interesting uh, no that, just just i it was just great to have them around the place i i think it's great that the club does keep those those legends around the club in some capacity you know yeah because if you've ever done well for celtic you know yourself the fans will back you 100 percent, oh. but they don't fucking forget either if you've done anything wrong no, like, no. You're, you're totally Aye. getting burnt in the cross man oh, like, like they're not daft they don't fuck <laughs> about that like, when you did did you not were you not the hydro there as well with the celtic Aye, a few weeks ago there was uh martin the gaffer was there uh sutty henrik john orton johan mialbi jackie mcnamara lubo stilly and myself on a monday night there was like fourteen thousand people in the hydro I, I don't know if any other clubs would get that. Even your Man United's or Liverpool's, I don't know if they get fourteen thousand mm -hmm. people in a in a one venue to sit and talk ex players talk shite. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was it was phenomenal. Great the night. Celtic fans just love it. Like, the same as the Rangers fans, like they'll back their team. I think there was fourteen thousand there, but the probably thirteen and a half thousand of them were just there to see Henrik. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How do you feel doing something like that? Do you, feel, do you still sick? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine with stuff like that. I'm more nervous sat in front of you than I was in front of 14,000 people, <laughs> the amount of viewers you've got. Uh, is, uh, what do you think looking back at your career? I look back with some great memories. Uh, Travelled the world, met some great people, played against great players, played with great players. And uh, that's some, every now and again, I'll get the medals out and have a little look at them and try and polish them up a bit. But uh, ah, you look back and you think, ah, you know, I didn't do bad. If you'd have said to me at 16 when I broke my neck in a car crash, you're going to play 500 games, you're going to play for Newcastle, Bolton, Aston Villa, Glasgow, Celtic, Leeds United, your country. At 16 when I was in that hospital bed, I would have snapped your hand off. Is there any player you'd have loved to have played with? Um, any player I'd love, I would, I would, I would love to have played with Maradona. He, he was Maradona. As a kid growing up, Maradona. Brian Robson, he was, he was another one of mine when I was a kid growing up. So, Glenn Hoddle, as some of them, when I was a kid growing up, I used to watch. But uh, you look at the likes of Messi and that now. Um, Ronaldo, was lucky enough to play against them, but just phenomenal players. But uh, no, all in all, um, happy. 
Yeah, a lot of trophies, a lot of memories. Aye. Playing with world class players, like for any footballer, that's all you ever dream of. Get a cap for your country. Like Aye. You ticked a lot of boxes. Yeah, I would have liked in a 20 caps for my country, but I'll have to settle for the one, would I? Yeah, and obviously when the career's over, you've got a phone call to do the boxing event where I met you. Um, how was that experience? Do you know what? I enjoyed the training. Loved the training. Didn't particularly enjoy the sparring. I had a look at some of your videos on your sparring on Instagram. Do you not spar with Beats? Craig Beatty? Yeah. I thought you did, I. Bust my nose. I, I bet he can bang Beats. He can bang, a big mate. boy. He's six feet odd. Yeah. And he's strong. And he can scrap. He's been sparring for years. Yeah. Well, the lad I fought, Simon Webb, he's been boxing since 2012. Oh, I, has he? I didn't pull gloves on until five weeks before my fight. Mm -hmm. Didn't know how to stand or anything. Yeah. So it was all new to me. But I enjoyed the training. It was, it was like five or six weeks intense. I loved that. But in terms of what, once I start getting hit back, I, was, I thought I was Muhammad Ali when the pads were out. Mm -hmm. But then, as soon as someone starts hitting you back, it's a different game, isn't it? Different game. So I'm, uh, I'm fought one, lost one. I'm staying at that. I'm not getting back in the <laughs> ring. I know you're getting back in the ring, but yeah. I'm not getting back in the ring. I love it. I did, at the start, like you say, you're nervous at sparring because every man thinks they can fight. But when you actually, when you hit the pads, it sounds good. But when you're actually up against someone who hits back Aye. and moves, it's a different ball game, but I just like to, the experience of pushing myself to the limits. Plus, I'm getting paid. It feeds my kids, and uh, and it was just a great experience. Aye. It promotes my name, promotes my brand. Like brilliant. It's business for me, bro. Aye. Your, ring, your I mean. ring entrance was something else, man. Seven something minutes, else. mate. Aye, brilliant. I was fucking tired. You ripped mate. the bollocks yeah. out of it, to be but fair. But I was told to keep him in the ring waiting because apparently the, the lights were so warm, it just tires your opponent right. out. So my, my coach, Andy McCart, was saying everything's fucking percentages I'm just going with the flow but the time I got to the ring I was shattered I, I did train really hard but then I was fucked after the two minutes in there nervous energy yeah. we were main event and so it was, it was just waiting so long Aye. a great experience met that some great brilliant. people no, no, listen it's not like walking on a you know I brox with mm -hmm. you've got 10 mates with you to hide behind you know what I mean once mm -hmm. I got in that ring I thought fuck me it's just me and him now I was shitting myself but uh Listen, like you say, great experience. My missus had a great night because she come in the dressing room after the game and after the fight and you had your top off, so she seen you topless, <laughs> mate, she was buzzing. <laughs> what about, uh, we'll touch on the book again, how was that experience for you, putting that all into I, paper? Do, do you know what, it was It was like, uh, it was a little bit therapeutic, if you want, getting a lot of stuff off your chest, you know what I mean, that you'd bottled up for a long time and uh, I never wanted to do one, I didn't really want to do it and then, all the lads had done them, Sutty had done it, Stilly and Petroff, Lenny had done it, Jackie Mack had just done one, and I just thought, you know what, maybe it's time that I do one, I'm, I'm getting on to 50. Um, so it was good, I've enjoyed doing it, yeah, I'm pleased it's out, I'm pleased it's done and dusted. He's asked us to do another one, but I'm not, I'm not sure I've got one in us. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, where can people buy this book, Tomo? Uh, Amazon, um, I think it's going into Waterstones, uh, possibly, hopefully try and get it in the Celtic shop in the coming months. Um, War Cry Publishing's website, then, uh, but Amazon's been it's gone, been going really well. You can have some good feedback on it. Do you still get to the games, the Celtic? Did they give you free tickets? No, shit? do you know what? I've not been back since I left, but um, one of the directors has just invited us up next month. So I'm going up to the Dundee game in um, February, end of February. So good, I'm looking man. forward to going back. I've not really fancied going back, but I just feel, you know, I've been away long enough now. I've, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's your home. You start a bit better with that kind of experience. Aye, be, be, because of what happened getting sacked in 2012, that's why I've kept out the way of it type of thing, do you know what I mean? But listen. But somebody who's fuck stuck you in? Like, who says that anyway? Do you ever know? Nah, you don't. You even get an incline? Nah, or was it just an excuse to get rid of you? Probably just an excuse and all the, the stuff that was in about me divorce and stuff like that and the drink driving. I think it was a culmination of all those things. So. I just kept out of the way for a few years, but listen, it's 10 years down the line now, so time to go back. Forgive and forget, brother. Aye, 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 mate, aye, aye. Without, mean. without a doubt, so, well, brilliant. Listen for coming on today, brother, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Brilliant. Good luck with the book. Thanks and, a lot, James. Uh, I'll Thanks catch for having up us. with you next time you're here, bro. Thanks, Love pal. Cheers, mate. Thank you.